without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jeff Lassard, Managing Director in Global Business Consulting of Cushman & Wakefield. Jeff? Great. Thanks, Brett. And hello, everyone. Welcome to Cushman & Wakefield Business Consulting's WebEx on Workplace Strategy. My name is Jeff Lassard. I'm Managing Director and Office Solutions Lead for our business consulting practice here at Cushman & Wakefield. I'm talking to you today from New York City, so if you hear honks or sirens in the background, that's why everything's fine, but we'll try to keep the noise to a minimum. We're thrilled today to be talking with you about workplace strategy. Workplace strategy is one of the most timely and urgent topics for our industry and has an enormous impact on our ability as real estate and facility professionals to help our companies get the most out of their investments. So we've packed a lot of valuable material for you into today's session. We have two objectives for this WebEx. First, we want to provide you with ideas and concepts that you'll be able to use in conversations with your stakeholders. Second, and more importantly, we want to challenge your thinking about the workplace trends and changes that we're all seeing so that you'll be able to lead the development of solutions that maximize your company's return from these important investments. And here's our agenda to achieve those objectives. This represents a synthesis of our work with clients across the globe, as well as the trends, challenges, and opportunities we've heard from across the industry. During this WebEx, we'll cover four topics. First, why senior executives increasingly care about workplace strategies. Second, the drivers of change in the workplace. Third, specific workplace strategy and design trends. And fourth, and briefly, how our team, Christian Wakefield Business Consulting, can partner with you to create significant value for your organizations. Some more housekeeping before we get started. The formal presentation will probably run 40 to 45 minutes, and we'll use the final minutes uh, for Q&A. And due to the large number of attendees on today's call, you'll be in listen-only mode until then. If you want to ask a question, as Brett mentioned, use the Q&A box. Introduce yourself by name, company, and location. I would welcome your feedback, so please email me or share your ideas after to let me know how I can make this an even more impactful presentation. And with that, let's get on to the material itself. We're first going to examine why senior executives care so much about this topic. The CEOs report that their top challenges are related to human resources, operational excellence, and innovation. Now, that's what the conference board's annual CEO survey recently determined. And so it makes sense that we start here. Nearly all of our clients have objectives and metrics that flow up to their CEO's agenda and annual plan. I know I do, and I'm sure you do too. Now, at its best, the work that we do on behalf of our stakeholders and that we here do on behalf of our clients contributes to and aligns with the CEO agenda. As we'll see in a moment, workplace strategies are critical to helping our clients and our stakeholders align with the most important concerns and objectives of CEOs. Now let's examine in more detail how each of these challenges can be addressed through workplace strategies. First, I, I want to spend some time talking about financial performance. You probably noted that the conference board survey didn't include financial returns as a top CEO challenge, and we think the reason for this is simple. Everything a corporation does comes back to shareholder value. The purpose of this survey was to get under the hood and discover the most important of all the different areas CEOs have to think about when it comes to driving value and returns. Now we're going to talk in a moment about the ways the workplace helps CEOs with these top concerns. But it's important to note as well that workplace strategy has a direct connection to financials given that it's one of the most powerful levers for reducing occupancy costs. And this is, as you know, primarily accomplished in two ways. First, through desk sharing, and second, through smaller work settings. But we're not going to focus a lot today on the financial impacts of workplace strategy, and this is for two reasons. First, the financial business case for workplace strategies is fairly straightforward. And secondly, as companies emerge from the Great Recession, they're supplementing workplace strategy business cases with the significant human capital, operational, and innovation benefits that these strategies can deliver. So let's briefly review the human capital benefits of workplace strategies. Providing a compelling workplace can help retain and attract employees. We know that. Our clients share with us that workplace communicate in a very visceral way a company's narrative. Workplaces help employees feel a more personal connection to their companies, their jobs, and their colleagues. 
In addition to attraction and retention, the best workplaces increase the effectiveness of employees. The metric that human resources use for this is called engagement. Engagement is the extent to which employees go above and beyond to complete their work responsibilities. A workplace that provides employees with an environment tailored to both their personal style and work activity needs has a very strong impact on engagement. Unfortunately, though, as a recent article in the Wall Street Journal reported, you can see it there on the right, 52% of us are not engaged at work. So how can workplaces be used to increase employee engagement? This page lists what research tells us are the top seven drivers of employee engagement. This is a really important page. We think the workplace can help support four of these drivers. You may want to jot these down for reference as we go through pictures of actual workplaces later in the WebEx. First, through the use and design of shared areas, workplaces can help build relevant connections up and across the organization. Second, an exciting workplace can act as a real non-cash reward. Third, if designed correctly, workplaces can provide employees with better opportunities to demonstrate their impact to people across the organization. <clears throat> And finally, the workplace can embody a company's values. Think of the difference between an office with a solid wood door and an office with a glass door. They say two very different things about the values of a company, don't they? A great example of linking the workplace to human capital is Bloomberg News. Their website includes a nice video on their new headquarters in Manhattan. What's fascinating to me, though, is where on the website they chose to place the video. It's in the career section good evidence of how they value the workplace as a driver of the HR strategy and objectives. The second CEO challenge is operational excellence. We can think of operational excellence as optimizing returns from a company's assets, or put another way, getting more from the same stuff. Typical company assets are listed there at the center of the page. And you'll see when we talk about company assets, we're looking at a combination of both the tangible, like PP&E, and the intangible, like brand. And we've already talked about the workforce, but workplaces can impact more. And I want to call out two assets in particular. The first is brand. Think of the mileage that Google gets from its workplaces and how anxious we all are to see how the Apple campus is going to turn out. These companies do a great job of using space to promote their brand. And brand image is so important for many reasons. What it conveys to current and future employees about the company the image it creates in the minds of customers, and the influence it has over current and potential investors. The second asset I want to talk about is proprietary business processes. Workplace can significantly improve workflow and efficiencies. For example, what if teams across a consumer product development process were able to decrease handoff times and improve feedback loops? That would be pretty powerful, I think. And in fact, that's how progressive consumer product companies are designing their spaces. Better lines of sight, common spaces that create occasions for informal interaction, and adjacencies that mirror, in a physical sense, how a design and a sketch pad evolves into an actual physical product and a plan to bring it to market. The third CEO challenge is innovation. Now there's one thing that we know about innovation from the research. It doesn't happen in silos. Many of history's greatest innovators managed to create and build a cross-disciplinary coffeehouse environment within their work routines. And we've, we've listed some examples here, including probably the most famous example, Bell Labs. In its heyday, Bell Labs employed chemical engineers, statisticians, structural engineers, astronomers, and nuclear physicists. At their headquarters in New Jersey, these disciplines were thrown together in the same place. As a result, scientists had the opportunity to work collaboratively and, importantly, across disciplines. And in fact, many alumni create uh, credit the shared lunchroom as a key enabler of innovation. And the result? Seven Nobel Prizes, the transistor, the laser, information theory, the photovoltaic cell, and multiple other computer-related inventions and innovations. So, how can we help our stakeholders enhance and accelerate innovation through workplace strategy? Solutions include consolidating and integrating the operation, building a variety of spaces for formal and ad hoc collaboration, 
designing opportunities conducive to informal interaction and the cross-pollination of ideas, and providing quiet spaces that support private, heads-down work. I love this quote from Steve Jobs. This is a leader who understood this idea in a fundamental way. Let's pivot now to talk about what's changed and currently changing in our workplaces. The past seven years have been a time of tremendous changes. Social media is now an ever-present force in our lives. At the same time, companies have taken more away from us in terms of space, leaving us with less privacy to conduct our work activities. And finally, the effects of the Great Recession continue to linger. We're spending more time in the office for fear of our careers and our livelihoods. And this exacerbates the bad effects of the first three changes here on the page. These raise profound questions about the workplace and present difficult challenges for our companies and our internal stakeholders. Now that we've looked back and understand the environment in which we operate, what trends are we contending with in 2014? So as we sit and work with clients, these are, the, these are the top five workplace trends that we're seeing in the market. You can see that they go beyond simple and sort of boring observations about utilization. Instead, they get to the heart of some pretty fundamental questions about the workforce. Helping our stakeholders successfully prepare and respond to these trends is a tremendous opportunity for us all. Instead of mere real estate experts, we'd be positioned as trusted business advisors, helping our companies optimize valuable human capital investments in addition to optimizing financial returns. And we'll spend the next few minutes thinking about these trends in more depth. We've all heard a lot about millennials, those younger than 32 that make up the generation of professionals joining the workforce in ever-increasing numbers. In fact, by 2020, 46% of our colleagues will be millennials, almost half. And by 2025, 75%, three quarters will be millennials. So I think it's really important that we understand who these people are and what motivates them. Now, we've all heard the negative things about millennials, that they were raised by helicopter parents, have been showered with praise their whole lives, and are demanding employees. But I think we have to look past these stereotypes to understand the defining characteristics of this demographic if we're going to help our stakeholders meet the talent management challenges of today and the future. As we'll see, many of these defining characteristics will impact the way that companies think about their workplaces. The clients with whom we work are asking with urgency how they should pivot their space strategies to meet the needs and aspirations of this generation. As we reviewed before, workplaces are an important part of a company's brand, really their, empl their employee value proposition. And here's the thing. Millennials view workplaces as an extension of your company's brand. And here's the key insight. This is really important. Millennials behave as consumers of space and not as users of space. They engage with brands far more extensively and personally than do older generations, and they expect their values to be reflected in the brands that they purchase and the companies they work for. But this retail mindset of theirs changes the game in fundamental ways. The traditional approach to marketing and change management, linear, rational, and hierarchical, doesn't work with this generation. Millennials want and expect a two-way reciprocal relationship with companies. And so I think this should change the way that we think about work environments and how we create work environments. We think that engaging employees early and often increases your odds of achieving excellence. As the quote at the bottom of the page suggests, these workplaces will capture buzz and support employee productivity in ways that are unexpected and impactful. And the HR executives we work with on our projects, they concur. They report that millennials are selective and they crave authenticity. In job interviews, millennials often flip the script, so to speak. The company isn't interviewing them as much as they're being interviewed by the company. We know that creating great workplaces uh, isn't easy. It takes time, money, vision, and the buy-in of senior business leaders. However, it's incredibly important for attracting the next generation of workers. Done right, the workplace will become a powerful ambassador for your company's brand and employee value proposition. 
there's so much more that we should all know about millennials. And so that's why two of our colleagues have written a really great white paper that investigates this critical demographic in more detail. Across the next few days, we'll use the email address that you provided when you logged in to send you the white paper. And please feel free to share it. And should you have any questions, we'd be happy to get on the phone and discuss it with you. But back to the material. The second trend that we're seeing in the work uh, uh, out there with our clients is, uh, is workplaces evolving into something called a third place. A third place is a space that accommodates different uses and thus delivers multiple benefits, some of the comforts of home, some of the infrastructure required to work, and some features for having fun or relaxing. Hallmarks of a third place include the following. Recall the changes in work that we've seen since 2007, social media, less space, less privacy, and longer days. Third places are the logical product of these changes. What started as a few coffee-addicted people realizing that the corner Starbucks could actually be a great place to get work done has evolved into a fully formed movement, especially in urban environments. Now, I want to share with you one of my favorite third places, the lobby of the Ace Hotel in New York City. And here it is, the lobby of the Ace, located at 29th and Broadway in New York City. The Ace is situated in what may be the hottest property market in the country right now, Midtown South. Take a look and you'll immediately be struck by the eclectic design. But I think there's something more fundamental going on here. The Ace lobby provides space for people to hang out, work, and socialize. Those of you who have been there also know that off the lobby there's a coffee shop and two restaurants. And here's a picture of the Ace during the day where we can see millennials in what many consider to be their natural habitat. And when we think back to the defining characteristics of millennials, it's not at all surprising that millennials love third places. And we actually see in use here some of the hallmarks of third place that we looked at previously. Here the space is being used for work, collaborating, and individual activities. Now, I have a friend who works for Spotify, the streaming music service, and he uses the ACE in exactly the way you've seen here, for breakfast meetings, heads down work, and when he has time for socializing. And speaking of socializing, here's the scene uh, of the lobby during the night where uh, the bar scene is overtaking the more professional uses that we see during the day. This is truly a dynamic 24-7 space. Now, all of this is important because we see professional office spaces picking up this trend and building spaces that create a distinct and engaging experience through multiple uses, not merely a space in which to sit and work. This is Noya House, also in New York City. Noya House bills itself as a private membership work collective for individuals and teams. Think of them as a cool high-end Regis but with cutting-edge programming that brings together innovators, business leaders, creators, and artists. Now, this is a space that's truly built for work in the year 2014. And who wouldn't want to work here? I would. What's instructive is that it looks so similar to third places that weren't necessarily built for work in mind, like the lobby of the Ace Hotel. Here we have spaces designed for work, relaxing, and eating. As the number of millennials in the workplace continues to increase and as companies continue to work really hard to attract and retain their best employees, look for spaces like this to debut and mature in corporate environments across the next five to seven years. Your stakeholders may not yet have this vision, but you can help paint it for them. Trend three is a growing realization that the pendulum has, has swung too far that our spaces are too open and too loud. And nearly one third of us are introverts. If you're not an introvert yourself, you're definitely married to one, you manage one, work with one, or you're raising one. Never since 1930s, when Dale Carnegie wrote How to Win Friends and Influence People, corporate America has celebrated the extrovert. The ideal business person is thought to be outgoing, assertive, and gregarious. Also, we've elevated teamwork almost above everything else to the point where we assume that it's always the optimal way of working. So it's not at all surprising that our offices are designed for extroverts. But as we'll see, our workplaces actually don't even serve them very well. Susan Cain has written an important book called Quiet. The book contains a story that I'd like to share with you about workspaces and their effect on the productivity of all personality types. 
In Silicon Valley, the coding war games are legendary. The objective is simple. Identify the best programming team. Over 600 software developers from over 60 companies participate in this annual contest for bragging rights and undoubtedly even more lucrative career opportunities. Now, lucky for us, the coding war games are also an almost perfect experiment for understanding how workspace affects white-collar productivity for introverts and extroverts alike. Now, what the organizers of the coding war games found surprised them. Here are the things that didn't matter to performance. Salary didn't matter. Years of experience didn't matter. And actually, surprisingly, the time invested to complete the activity, that didn't matter either. However, the organizers did find that programmers from the same company performed more or less at the same level. Now, what could possibly account for the differences in performance? I think you probably see where this is going, right? It turns out that the type of workspace provided to participants really affected the results. And here we see the four ways that organizers measured the workspace of coding war games participants. Size, privacy, how quiet it was, and level of interruption they found that the best performers there in the dark blue, the first quartile, when compared with the worst performers there in the light blue, the fourth quartile, had significantly more space, more privacy, less noise, and people interrupted them less. And actually, this isn't very surprising, right? After all, how many of us would say that these are important workplace attributes? I would, and I bet the majority of you would on the phone. And that's really important. These aren't just important for introverts, they're important for us all. But again, our built spaces, along with the changes in work that we've reviewed earlier in the presentation, well, our, our spaces often work against us. Less privacy, less quiet, more interruptions, and less space in which to operate. So it's not surprising that only 30% of Americans feel engaged at work. In short, we're miserable. And numerous studies point to the greatest culprit. We increasingly feel as though we can't spend the time and duration necessary to focus and actually complete tasks. Now, solving this workforce crisis should be near the top of every CRE and HR executive agenda. And as trusted advisors to our stakeholders, we can help lead this conversation in meaningful ways. The fourth trend that we're seeing is the rise of incubators and co-working. We've already seen how Noya House designs its space. The reason these work arrangements are increasingly successful and sought after is because they drive innovation. And as you remember, driving innovation is a top CEO challenge. Now here we've listed the definitions of these concepts. Also, these work arrangements share DNA. And like most things, grew in popularity to meet a pressing need and take advantage of new circumstances. Two attributes listed here may be a bit surprising, solutions-oriented and selective. Of course, most companies hope to be solutions-oriented, but I think this is something different. The mature companies like GE Capital, Consumer Reports, and Time Inc. are actually getting small teams off their campuses and placing them in incubator and co-working spaces, using these spaces as special project accelerators to drive an ethic of cross-disciplinary collaboration and problem solving. Other companies like State Farm are actually building their own co-working spaces. So in effect, these companies are creating startup cultures within mature and staid organizations, and they're doing it through the use of space. And as a real estate person, I think that's so exciting and amazing. But you know, why is this important now? To put it simply, what it means to be employed and at work is changing. Our ability to connect the dots in ways that we've never seen uh, before, never been able to before across industries, geographies, ideas, and generations, well, that's creating a demand for space outside corporate hierarchies and control. And more and more professionals are starting to realize that, that given all this, they don't need to work for a company anymore. And as a result, by 2020, in fact, 40% of us are projected to fall in this category. But similar to our discussions on third place, there are larger ideas and implications here that we can share with our clients and our stakeholders and apply across our work. Human beings are social animals. The more technology provides us with the ability to work independently, the more we're going to crave being together in meaningful ways. I want to shift gears just a bit to describe the fifth trend. So it turns out that sitting down, well, it's killing us. 
to explore this next trend, I've included a few infographics. Now, throughout history, humans spend, uh, we've spent most of our time moving about, right? Now, more and more, we find ourselves sitting, slouched and hunched in the chairs, moving minimally. And look how little of our time is dedicated to serious physical activity, less than an hour a day. Six and a half hours is dedicated to something called low-intensity physical activity, otherwise known to you and me as standing and walking. A majority of our day is spent pretty much inactive. And if you've ever seen the movie WALL-E, you know where this is leading. Sitting makes us fat, and being fat leads to an early death. I bet that almost everyone on the call right now is sitting down. I know I am. And look at all the bad things that are happening to our bodies. So I think this raises maybe a disturbing question. Most companies provide us with our workspaces, including the seats that we sit in. So what responsibility do they bear for these negative impacts? And now that we understand the research, what responsibility do they bear, we all bear, for improvements? In fact, sitting may be the next big focus for improving public health. And as you can see here, creative types are already working on awareness campaigns. Now, another thing we noticed is a recent development uh, in a partnership between the U.S. Green Building Council, the folks who do lead, and the International Well Building Institute. In April, they announced that the U.S. Green Building Council will provide third-party certification for the well building standard. They've partnered with doctors and public health officials and done a bunch of research and investigate things like the transmission of germs through certain building materials, air quality, and natural light. And they're certifying buildings based on those criteria. And so in my opinion, this is going to be as significant for property owners eventually as lead certification. Now here's what we can learn from these trends. From my perspective, and what's most exciting, we are in the midway point of a period of profound fundamental changes. And that's a little bit scary, but it's also a time of incredible opportunity uh, for helping our companies improve and making our mark. But simply put, the stakes are higher than ever. And as real estate and facility leaders, this is a conversation that we need to lead with our stakeholders. Now, let's take a look at the ways these trends have materialized in progressive workplaces. So finally, we, we actually get to look at pictures of, of workplaces now. So first, the physical boundaries between different space uses are crumbling. Progressive companies are building spaces that look a lot like these, individual work areas that blend into eating areas that blend into areas for collaboration. Millennials love these spaces. They're the physical embodiment of what defines them as a generation. They enable collaboration, they reject structure, they're flexible, and they express distinct ideas and values. And at their best, these corporate environments feel like really cool third places. And we live in an age of increasing transparency and the new office spaces are no different. These spaces enable employees to make better connections across the company, ideally leading to increased collaboration and innovation. Now notice that these spaces promote transparency in different ways, vertically, horizontally, by use, and by professional level. Now think about the real estate industry for a second. In our business, information is the ultimate competitive advantage, right? So to what, what degree would our production increase if our offices were totally transparent? How would that help place our stakeholders at the center of everything we do? Interestingly, and maybe predictably, we've begun to see the backlash against the trend towards open concepts that really we've seen across the past 15 years. The companies are recognizing, thanks to research like Susan Cain's, that most employees need some amount of privacy, that the introvert within us all requires it to be productive. The privacy at the office can come in many forms. And one form that I'd like to call out really has nothing to do with real estate or, or space per se. This form of privacy is so ubiquitous in 2014 that we forget it. It was relatively new and exciting in the early 2000s. Of course, it feels like we've always had Walkman and portable CD players, but the iPod brought an entirely new aesthetic to corporate America, those, those white earphones. If you wanted to speak with someone wearing earbuds, you basically had to interrupt them. Mostly, people didn't bother because the basic message that those earphones send is, leave me alone, I'm working. So privacy is very important. 
But hold on, you may say, we just saw other evidence that offices are moving towards radical transparency. So how do, how do we resolve this apparent conflict? Smart designers are resolving the conflict between transparency and, pro and privacy by ensuring a plethora of choices so that you can match your workspace to your work activity at any given point across the workday. Here again, millennials love choice. At their best, these corporate environments feel like really cool third places. But getting this right requires a holistic perspective on the employee value proposition. Corporate real estate, information technology, human resources, and business unit executives have to work in tight partnership to get not only the space right, but the tools and policies to make them be successful. The confluence of three factors have driven progressive employers to ensure that the workplaces contribute to employee health and wellness. And the first is the sustainability movement. We're no longer building with materials that make some of us sick. Second, as, and as we've seen, employees are spending more time at the office, cutting into the time they would have spent at the gym or out being active. And third, the war for talent. The growing realization that attracting and retaining the best employees is a top CEO priority. But put it all together, and it's not surprising that we're seeing an increased focus on health and wellness in many forms. Standing desks are becoming more common, especially out west. Office canteens are stacked with a wide variety of healthy options, and some companies are even experimenting with treadmill desks. In fact, Coachman Wakefield, uh, business, our business consulting team in Chicago, um, has our own treadmill desk that we're, uh, that we're trying out. Finally, industries far down the, in, uh, the workplace innovation curve like legal, utilities, and financial services have started to adopt progressive workplace programs. It's not surprising that this transition began in Europe and Australia. These, these places have always led the workplace change charge, and we're now beginning to see these types of companies begin to get serious about it here in the United States. The picture on the screen is a partner's office at Norton Rose Fulbright in Brisbane, Australia. Looks pretty different than the traditional build here in the States, doesn't it? So just a brief two-slide commercial about, uh, about our practice, Cushion Wakefield Business Consulting. Um, we're a diverse team of management consultants, workplace strategists, labor economists, engineers, certified financial analysts. We're distributed across, uh, across the globe, and, and we help clients uh, develop strategies that solve challenges at the intersection of real estate and business operations. So location strategies, industrial site selection, workplace strategies, larger portfolio strategies, services that we generally focus on are listed here. Uh, some of our clients are, are listed here on the page. Um, we've done different projects for different types of clients. Again, pretty diverse roster of clients and a diverse roster of projects as well. So a few minutes ago, we went, all, uh, we went over all the reasons why workplace strategy is so important to stakeholders and also how all of the changes taking place in today's personal and business worlds have elevated workplace strategy to such a high-profile place in the minds of senior executives. What I want to do now is spend just a few minutes talking about why using the information I just shared with you can be such a powerful tool when it comes to driving change within your companies. Now take a look at the items at the bottom of this page. These items were tested to understand how much of an impact they have on driving individuals to buy from other companies. Actually, if you think about it, the type of decisions we try to influence as change agents working within complex corporate environments. But think for a second about which one or ones you think would have the biggest impact. Well, I'll tell you what I thought. I picked demonstrated expertise and delivering useful data. I thought these would have a huge impact. After all, expertise and information are critically important when it comes to building trust and getting the job done. Now let's take a look at what the data shows. I don't know about you, but I was shocked by this. Teaching stakeholders something new and providing a compelling reason to act are not only the most important, but the stuff I picked wasn't even close. Now at first I couldn't figure this out. But then when I looked more closely at the research, it became clear. And I'd like to explain with an analogy. Here we have the analogy of the elephant and the rider. And some of you may have heard this analogy before. 
It was first offered up by Jonathan Haidt of UVA and further explained in the book, Switch, How to Change Things When Change is Hard, by Chip and Dan Heath. Now, the rider, the rider represents the conscious, rational mind. The elephant represents the unconscious, emotional mind. That despite the best and hardest efforts of that rider, at the end of the day, the elephant can't be entirely controlled by the rider's sheer effort. In our world, the elephant and the rider represent stakeholders who try to make business decisions rationally. But like all human beings, they're heavily influenced by the powerful gut feelings, biases, and emotions. Most organizations make the mistake of appealing primarily, if not entirely, to the rider, the rational side of things. It turns out that unless we appeal just as much, if not more to the elephant, the emotional side, we're going to fail to convince our stakeholders to adopt and champion change. Now, it's certainly interesting to talk about things through analogy, but how about hard data? How about proof? Well, it turns out that research shows that the emotional side of things has two times the impact as the rational side. So the elephant has two times the impact of the rider. Now, why is emotion so important? Well, very simply put, it comes down to fear. Stakeholders are afraid of losing time and effort. They're afraid of wasting company money. They're afraid of losing credibility. And ultimately, they're afraid of getting fired. The best way to influence change to, uh, to in effect, cause stakeholders to buy what you're selling is to appeal to that powerful emotional side of their decision making. And the reason why teaching them something new and, uh, new and compelling um, is so important is because doing that breaks through their biases and their preconceived notions. It shakes them up. It gets them thinking about the world in entirely new ways. And it provides you with an opportunity to guide their thinking and understand the unique value that change will bring to them personally. And this, this is what's known as delivering commercial insight. Let's package all this together to understand how it fits into the business cases the Cushman Wakefield uh, Business Consulting helps clients develop for their stakeholders and business cases that I'd encourage you to develop for your stakeholders. This page explains what a commercial message needs to accomplish. Our messages to stakeholders need to pass through each level or, or oval on this page and ultimately land at what we call commercial insight. It's a great test for the materials that you use with your business partners. We, of course, need to provide good information, thought leadership, and insight to get started. But ultimately, successful thought leadership may teach stakeholders something new but still fail to produce true insight if that teaching isn't frame-breaking. Or put another way, if it doesn't disrupt the way that they think uh, in a way that's meaningful to them in their business objectives. Commercial insight is at the very top of the hierarchy. As the strongest commercial message, it challenges stakeholder thinking about their own business problems and shows them that the status quo is no longer acceptable. And that, that is a highly emotional message to send. Through commercial insight, stakeholders learn something new about their business and as a result appreciate the value in your proposed solution. So to recap, I hope we've shared ideas and concepts with you that you can take away and use uh, across your work activities. And I also hope that we've challenged your thinking about this topic and brought you new ideas that uh, can really influence uh, the way you work with stakeholders. And with that, I sincerely thank you for your time today. I hope you enjoyed the, the session and found it impactful and valuable. And, and now, Brett, let's open it up to questions. Thanks, Jeff. Wonderful job. Uh, again, if you uh, have a question, please feel free to use the bottom right hand of your WebEx. Uh, type your name, type your company, and type your question, uh, and Jeff would be happy to answer it uh, as they come in. So we'll give everyone a minute or two to collect their thoughts, and please submit your questions. If we can't 
Cameron Chase is raising his hand. So Cameron, I'm going to unmute your line and you can feel free to ask your question. Cameron? No, we may have uh, technical difficulties, as they say. So I'm wondering if uh, if Cameron can type it in, and Brett, maybe you can uh, repeat yeah. it. And uh, Jeff, we just got an email from Mark Tabak at CNW. Uh, will you be sending the presentation materials out to the various participants? Yes. Or the the participants on the phone today? Yes. Uh, so we're sharing this material with with uh, audiences on a um, on a select basis. I'm happy to you know spend time on the phone going it through uh, with uh, with uh, those who are interested. But we're not planning on a um, sort of a, a general uh, all hands release to the market, at least not yet. Jeff, we got an anonymous question here. How do you anonymous, bridge the gap? Okay. How do you bridge the gap between millennials and older generations in the workplace? It, it, that is such a, a important question, and, and it's actually a question that we've received uh, through multiple times that we've delivered this material. So, um, number one is through effective change management efforts, right? So, making sure that we're engaging the workforce early and often, understanding what uh, functional needs require, what generational needs require. Um, what the company's objectives are and how we're shifting and, and creating workplaces that help the company achieve their objectives, particularly human resources objectives. Um, so effective change management programs are number one. Number two, an important concept that we talked about today is, is choice. And so choice um, has the benefit of, of meeting the needs of, again, multiple businesses, but also multiple generations. Um, Thirdly, and, and I think this is probably the most difficult to digest, and, and um, you know, we've certainly had this conversation actually here at, at Christian Wakefield about our workplaces, is that you know, real estate is a significant long-term forward commitment. And so when companies are making investments, particularly headquarters investments that are 10, 15, sometimes even 20-year commitments, um, we need to build spaces for the work force of the future, not the workforce that we have. And so, um, so as we see uh, generational shifts in, in the workforce, well, we actually we just finished work with a client where uh, a shocking 40% of their workforce could retire across the next five to seven years. It's really critical that we build work uh, workplaces for the future generation of, of workers. And that's a, that's a tough message uh, and a tough sort of lift for some companies, but it's critical. Thanks, Jeff. We have not gotten any uh, any further questions, so uh, feel free to to wrap it up. Well, again, thank you very much for attending. I um, I'm, I'm thrilled that you chose to spend you know 40 45 minutes with with Cushman Wakefield today. My email address is Jeffrey J E F F R E Y dot Lassard L E S S A R D at Cushwake C U S H W A K E dot com. Please email me again with feedback, questions. Be happy to engage uh, on, on any of these uh, topics with you. Um, and again, hey, thank Jeff, you so we much. Actually, we Jeff, we question. actually did just have a question come in, so I didn't want Shoot, I didn't mean to cut you it. off. But That's fine. We got a, a question from John Kasama. Um, I don't have a company here, but how do tenants and landlords resolve the need for higher parking ratios as a result of higher employee density? Yeah, that is a – that is – um, a really difficult challenge, obviously, especially in suburban locations. Um, you know, we've worked with clients um, that that simply can't get to the density required because of first their lease covenants, um, and then second because of the parking issue. Ways of addressing the parking issue, um, personally, I find are um, they're they're you know, make do efforts, right? So these include restriping. They include issuing uh, more parking passes than you have spaces and, and trying to sort of statistically understand how many cars you're going to have in the garage at, at, you know, during any one given day. Um, we've had clients use valet services um, and then also looking at uh, adjacent uh, real estate and lots, even 
you know, malls, frankly, um, and working with those owners to get reciprocal privileges. So, for instance, if you're next to a mall uh, during the week, uh, hopefully or likely, you know, not as many people are shopping there during um, during the week, so maybe you can get privileges to shop in the mall parking lot while during the, the weekends your corporate garage or lot can serve as overfill. But it's, it's, it's a difficult challenge and one that, that um, is full of compromises in, in our experience. Thanks, Jeff. Now I do not have any more questions. Got it. Well, everything I said before, I still mean thank you so much. Um, email me or, or call if you've got questions, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.